Hi, I'm Kirk Harnack. On This Week in Radio Tech, Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr join our guest, George Whittem. He's a leading expert on voiceover studio design. On This Week in Radio Tech, next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 108, recorded November 30th, 2011, of Mikes and Men. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Axia Audio and the new Radius IP Audio Console. Feature rich, affordable IP audio consoles from Axia on the web at axiaaudio.com. Plus, check out some of the 2,500 Axia IP Audio Studios worldwide at clients.axiaaudio.com. Hey, it's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Glad to have you along. This is the show where we talk about radio technology, how we get audio here and there, how we pick it up with microphones, hopefully well, nicely, clean, uh, how we get audio in and out of automation systems and through audio consoles. And, you know, we add in the talent and the traffic reports and the sports guy and uh, try to make it all into something that's content that folks want to listen to. Uh, radio, the radio industry has been doing that for years, although some would argue that occasionally it's not stuff folks want to listen to. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about just making, in this episode, this episode, we're going to talk about uh, voiceover. In other words, uh, getting the the every bit of a great voice talent uh, and getting that into electronic form so we can put it on the air, you know, re record it to a, a hard disk system um, and uh, and make that sound as good as possible. Our guest uh, is going to be George Whittem. We'll introduce him in just a moment. But first, let's uh, check out the best dressed engineer in radio from Manhattan, New York. It's Chris Tobin. Hello, Chris. Hello, Kirk. Hello, everyone. So far, so good. President Obama's in town, and traffic hasn't been snarled just yet. And pedestrian traffic is still moving about on the streets. So it's a good sign this, uh, today, or this evening. Well, you made it home, but you, you probably get home uh, via what? <laughs> via the subway, don't you? Subway, walking. The problem is his, his fundraising events take place approximately four blocks from where I live, four blocks in every direction. Uh, it's just, it's interesting, the frozen zones that appear. And actually, they're about to uh, lock down the avenue just across the street in about 20 minutes. So it should be lots of fun in the next hour or so. I guess you got to make sure you have plenty of peanut butter and toilet paper at the house. Because you're not going to be able to get out and get some, are you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, they definitely keep you from uh, crossing the street or walking up and down, depending on where he's going to be. And uh, the protesters are out tonight. They're uh, on 7th Avenue and 51st out by the Sheraton. So it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a busy night. You know, I, I won't be, speaking of protesters, I won't be satisfied until they actually start protesting this show. You know, Occupy Tort. Looking forward to that. Oh, that'll be the 1%. Hey, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Also with us uh, from uh, Muckwanago, Wisconsin, let's say hello to the Ninjaneer, Chris Tarr. Hey, Chris. Hi there. Occupying my bedroom. You can see the frog back there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am uh, Chris Tarr, the engineer, uh, and I am the director of engineering for Intercoms Milwaukee and Madison radio stations. Also uh, host the online forum, uh, broadcastengineering.info. I uh, write for Radio Guide and, of course, put my smiling face here uh, just about every Wednesday night. Or sure, glad that you're with us. And, uh, no, okay, like so this. Are you doing the same for a name? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that was. It wasn't me. That <laughs> <laughs> looks like the fun is beginning. Yeah, it sure does. <laughs> Jeez. So, uh, so we we have we have three broadcast engineers here. We have our guest who is um, I don't know is George a broadcast engineer or a little bit more specialized sort of engineer? You know, broadcast engineers can can don't don't tell the GM, but you know we do know how toilets work. Uh, I'm not going to run through this one. There's a cop standing right there. <laughs> That sounds like probably a not, but I also wanted to get a better look at this little brunette that probably you know five nine five ten ninety pounds soaking wet. CB, man. I have that's no CB. idea what's going on. That's probably someone with a hundred watt CB. Yeah, so, it's coming. Yeah. So, yeah. Is, is is who Skype is that? Is that coming through Burke? Oh, I'd break. 
I think so. Hey, hold on. Let's put a pause not, on this for a second. Not mine. <laughs> this week in CB radio. That's awesome. Anyway. <laughs> I couldn't well, ask for a better introduction. Thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks everybody. <laughs> oh man, uh, we we had a show on on RF grounding just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> no, I actually watched it. Okay, <laughs> let's let's uh, let's begin right before George here. Sorry. Is is that one at the uh, at, I, at the Twit Network? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there's not, it's not a live. Nothing's selected. It's just interference. So yeah, well, hopefully it will. <laughs> All right. Move away. So, uh, uh, put your your big edit uh, screen up right there, and we'll uh, we'll in, we'll introduce uh, we'll introduce George. You ready? Uh, we'll give him a place to uh, <laughs> to edit if they want to. In three, two, and uh, also joining us is an engineer who's um, well. I don't know if he's a broadcast engineer or not. He certainly specializes in something broadcast related. Let's say hi to George Whittem. Hey, George, how are you? Hey Kirk, I'm doing well. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I've I've kind of done everything. Um, I mean, but right now I'm specializing in voiceover, home studio support, consulting, and just making sure voice actors get the cleanest possible audio in their home studios because they pretty much all have to have one these days, and unless they happen to live right next door to a great one, you know, in a big city. Uh, but that's what I do. I've got uh, VOStudioTech.com where I run my business out of called Eldorado Recording Services, and uh, I'm just out there to keep people's home studios working. I've got a client base, a growing base of over 400 clients now that I just, uh, I'm like their virtual audio engineer, technician, mechanic, and, you know, psychologist all rolled into one. I bet it does take some uh, some psychology to work with some of the, uh, the the VO talent that that you do. So, you are, George, you've already alluded to okay, you you uh, you run this company that does engineering services primarily for voiceover talent. Now, you're located out in the West Coast, right? I am. I'm here in uh, Santa Monica. Is it seems like the West Coast has a disproportionate number of uh, voiceover talent? Am Definitely. I right about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. They they tend to flock here. I mean, uh, I know talent that have been very successful in Chicago and other markets that decide to come out here because that gives them an opportunity to have a piece of the, a bigger pie now. Um, you know, animation. I mean, this is where animation is being uh, recorded. You know, the voiceover talent's being recorded and ADR and looping and anything to do with Hollywood. There's a lot more options out here for voice talent. So if they want to work a ton... This is where they'll come. You know, that, that's kind of interesting because I, I, during the show, I'd like to get into that subject with you because um, between, you know, ISDN lines and, and, and now I, uh, IP audio over, even over the Internet, it's, it's certainly um, uh, not a requirement that a VO talent be in the Hollywood area. And yet, even though we have the ability to do uh, voiceover work from, you know, almost anywhere in the world, certainly any any good sized city in the world with uh, with good uh, ISDN or or internet connections um, still people tend to uh, gravitate toward these these work centers where um, where content where movies where animation as you said where television is, is made um, uh, let's go ahead and explore that right now before we get into some of the, the technicalities of designing and building a, a voiceover studio um, why do people gravitate anyway toward places where they actually may or may not have to be to, to get the work? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Well, you know, there's, there's a couple different kinds of talent out there. there. Well, there's a couple different tiers. You know, there's, there's, the, there's, the, there's the top tier, and they can, some of them can live anywhere. Most of them choose to live here, but I do have some top tier clients who are doing promo, uh, trailer, stuff that's national or even international, um, that do live outside of this market. But still, the vast majority seem to, to, to propagate here. I don't know. It's a nice place to live. Um, but also, you know, they want to have... Hey, it's a good question. I, if you could live anywhere, where would you live? And so, you know, because of that, there are clients of mine that are in Florida, um, you know, New York, and then sometimes, you know, in the Midwest and just somewhere in a nice big chunk of land in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, it's, it really depends on what somebody wants, but anybody can work, anybody can do voiceover work from anywhere. As long as you've got a broadband internet connection, 
you if you have the the wherewithal and the creativity you can do voice acting from anywhere hey uh chris and chris you guys please feel welcome to, to jump in here with, with a question i got i got a uh, you know a whole list of questions in my head here that i want to ask about i actually i got a question for chris tobin and chris tar uh before we get into george giving us uh his examples of voiceover studios that he has engineered set up built for uh various talent probably big some big name talent that that, that we've all heard of um uh, chris tobin chris tar what kind of uh home or, or voiceover studios have you guys been involved in building? Do you have, you know, morning show talent or, or some kind of talent that needs to do something from home? Um, a few years ago, I visited uh, Harpo Studios in, in Chicago, uh, where Oprah Winfrey, you know, does, does her show. And um, the engineers there told me, well, Oprah has also a small uh, VO studio at her Chicago apartment, right, at her condo. Uh, sometimes they might need her to say a sentence or uh, add something that they forgot to have her say uh, during the day when she was uh, at the studios. So, um, uh, you know, they would ask her to, you know, open the closet, uh, turn on the, turn on the, uh, the uh, Telos uh, Zephyr Extreme. Uh, you know, they would dial into her and, and here, please, please read this copy. And, you know, she'd, uh, she'd go ahead and, and, and get that done. That's a kind of an interesting example. I mean, obviously, Oprah didn't, uh, you know, sit down and, and, and record hours of, of voice, voiceover there. She had a professional studio at, at, at her, um, at Harpo Studios to do that. But for emergencies, there was that little room to get that done. Um, Chris Tobin, let's, let's go to you first. What kind of, uh, you know, at home or uh, off site studios have you been involved with? Oh, the off-site studios have uh, been real simple ones. So uh, for a couple of our sports anchors to do their sports cast from home on the weekends, uh, we did simple little uh, you know, little foam acoustic acoustic foam uh, partitions in a closet. Uh, a couple of the guys we just chose uh, let them use their uh, clothing. Uh, depending on the microphone we picked, it worked pretty well. And the microphones we've used have gone uh, been pretty much dynamic mics, SM7s. Uh, a couple of RE20s, RE27s, some of the talent preferred one or the other. We found the SM7s to be the most uh, pleasing, smooth, uh, I guess predictable audio in, in each case. And then a couple of places we uh, actually installed a whisper box. You know, it's a actually full-blown soundproof, or yeah, I'll say soundproof, but uh, yeah, acoustically, the you know, uh, it's the small ones. Uh, a couple of locations that we did it at, it just it was necessary because they're home. The house was just not right, so we did it in the garage. You know, it, it worked out really well. Um, it's just you got to you got to get creative, and, and no one solution meets everybody's need. And I'm yeah, sure George right. knows that. And others. So uh, I, I I would say in many cases, in a quick pinch, we've done the closet routine, and it's worked really well. We've actually had one person. The closet was so dead, we actually had to put a little a little echo on, <laughs> wet, wet the audio a bit. <laughs> <laughs> we, we couldn't. We couldn't figure out why it sounded so strange, and we realized, oh yeah, it's really dead in there. Uh, <laughs> but it worked cheaper. out well. It, it complemented the, the. In this case, it was a woman's voice, which was very asymmetrical. So it had an interesting uh, way of sounding when you didn't have when it was so quiet. It was just it was good. Chris Tar, how about you? You got any offsite studios for for folks, maybe at their home or at a separate office or something? Well, you know, I've got a studio in my basement for the voiceover work I do. Uh, oh, there which you go. Is a little, yeah, which uh, it's probably a little fancier than than what I would normally do. It's got, you know, it's that's what I was talking about the uh, A50 console and a uh, Shure SM5 uh, Symmetrics voice processor. But uh, generally, I've got one or two remote studios for talent, and and really all that is, it's really nothing fancy. We use um, Comrex access boxes, and it's typically just uh, like an RE20 into uh, a Symmetrics voice processor into the uh, the Comrex Access. And fortunately, I've run into cases with their houses where, uh, you know, they, they have a, a little study or something like that, that, you know, most people have carpeting, you know, carpeted floors, uh, things like that. So the rooms are, are pretty quiet. So I really haven't had to go through too much extreme to, to get somebody on the air. But, um, you know, generally, it, again, you know, you, you want to make sure that uh, whatever you buy, first of all, especially matches the stuff you have in your studios. So if you're using Symmetrics 52080s and, and SMR, uh, RE20s, make sure to get that for your talent who's going to be off-site so that uh, you can at least get it pretty close. Obviously, the, the codecs and things can sometimes add a little bit of, of change to them. <laughs> but you want to get them as clear as possible, uh, you know, as close as possible what you're running in the studio. You know, the advice from uh, Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr sure seems like uh, what what any broadcast engineer would say. And so... Let's let's bring in George now. George, uh, uh, I, my first question is, are we doing anything wrong? What, what would you do different than, than what we're doing? 
Well, you know, you guys are still all in the context of radio broadcast. Um, and the rest of the voiceover industry or the voiceover industry, voice acting industry, is a pretty different world um, when it comes to sound, what the expectations for sound reproduction are. For It's really all about natural sound reproduction. They, you know, if, if you're any more than three inches, if you're three inches or closer to a mic, you're probably not doing voiceover work. Um, we tend to be, um, and I say we, I'm not a voice actor. I guess it's the royal we. Uh, the, you tend to work the mic further away, uh, usually about six. We usually will do the hang 10 thing uh, to get about a six to eight inch gauge away from the mic. And um, most of the time, most of the time, we're using condenser microphones. We're not using uh, RA20s or SM7s. Reason being that I find that we have to use condenser mics mostly is that a lot of voice talent do not have a very powerful voice, and especially some of the women and, and the book narrators, things like that. And uh, if we need to get enough gain out of a SM7 or an RA20, we have to run the preamp wide open, sometimes higher yep. than 60 decibels, and we ended up with we ended up with a basically you know a noise floor that was we consider unacceptable. The noise floor gets above minus 55 dB. It's not going to work for most voice work. Yeah, I would so, agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you say um, natural, you know, there's most everybody in radio uh, has a, uh, you know, a, 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 a radio delivery. Now, whether it's the old, you know, the, the Hi, I'm ready radio, hopefully we're away from that. Uh, but still, plenty of folks work the mic. And so, George, are you saying that in the voiceover business, that working the mic is is not something that's done? It's it, You said they're typically, you know, hang 10 away from the mic. And so you're picking up uh, a very natural sound and not an affected sound. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, as soon as I hear proximity effect, I, I immediately have someone back off the mic. Um, unless, they have real, unless they come from radio mm -hmm. or they have engineering background and they really do know how to work a mic, the vast majority of my clients are voice actors. They're, they're SAG or AFTRA. They are actors. They're screen actors. And... Um, they're not used to even seeing a microphone. Um, it's usually on a boom pole over their head. So, uh -huh. you know, this is a whole new thing for them to have to be in a confined space with a microphone, not have the mic uh, feel like it's, you know, obtrusive to them, but still be able to get it in the, in the sweet spot. And we, I spend a lot of time, especially on all the consulting I do over the phone, which I'd say the majority of my work is done via Skype and stuff, um, is spent on positioning the mic and getting the room acoustics right. And we really like it dead in voiceover. It's a dead, uh, almost anechoic room is uh, what most voice uh, engineers, voiceover engineers, producers are gonna like to have because they wanna have complete control over the production and how it's gonna sound in the mix and, and all of that. So we just give them clean, unadulterated, natural, uh, no proximity effect or minimal proximity effect. Uh, sound and, th and that's that's our goal and it can be it can be a real challenge depending on the situation that some of these clients are in with uh, some pretty noisy spaces especially here in los angeles why don't you to walk us through uh, some some examples of, of acoustics? And by the way, I do want to get back to mic selection and preamp selection. I think that's real important and certainly something that a lot of, uh, of broadcast engineers can relate to. Um, I have my own client, a voiceover talent on the East Coast that who for whom I've built a, a couple of rooms, and I have some of these same problems with uh, with getting the room noise down uh, in this part of the country. Well, he's in Charleston, South Carolina, where um, homes are tend to be all wood. There's no brick, and they're also on stilts above the ground you know, for for hurricanes uh, and and for you know the uh, uh, low level flooding. So the, the houses tend to be very very noisy. And so he's trying to do voiceover work in his house. So, man, we've gone to all kinds of lengths with um, heavy cloth and getting into a small space and, and then using, uh, uh, you know, uh, RLX or, you know, sound, effect, you know the sound deadening materials or absorption materials. And still, it's, it's tough to get, I mean, if a truck goes by outside, well, got to do that take all over again. Yeah. Where, where, where would a person start 
uh, in in taking uh, an average space and, and making it as, as dead as possible, as quiet as possible? Well, yeah, there's dead and there's quiet. And those two things are different and they require different solutions. And, and people, one of the biggest misnomers is calling Oralex soundproofing foam. Those two words should never, soundproof foam, never go together. Right. Uh, because foam materials are much, are not dense at all. And that, so they have an ability to absorb sound and keep it from bouncing around. Whereas, uh, you know, when it comes to isolation, that's where we need to start talking about getting out the hammer and nails and uh, maybe get a contractor. Um, so it really depends on the severity of the issue. Uh, you know, and a lot of it actually, when, the, when, I first somebody, when first somebody works with me, the, I'll first ask them, are you being directed or are you self-directed? And that basically means, uh, you know, are you getting to work whenever the heck you want? Or do you have to work on demand? Are you scheduling? Are your sessions scheduled? Are you on a phone schedule? Or if you have ISDN, obviously, you're going to be working on the schedule. That's a big part of it because if you, have, if you can work any time, day or night, well, there's a lot of people doing book narration, you know, long-form narration. They get up at, you know, they, they, they work from like 1 or to 4 in the morning, 1 to 5 in the morning to get that quietest part of the day. That's the quiet but, part uh, of the day. It sure is. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, whatever you got to do, uh, you know, look, the book narration stuff I think is probably the most demanding in that it's long periods of time and you need a lot of uninterrupted time, very mm. clean, very low noise. Uh, you know, when you listen to an audio book, there's almost no, almost never any background music. Mm. So you're very exposed. Whereas doing stuff for radio and affiliates and commercials, there's almost always background music. So that masks, uh, you know, some of the noise floor problems. So um, it really depends on what the kind of work you're doing. But we deal with the soundproofing first. Um, and if budget allows, uh, we solve that problem with double wall, double ceiling, sometimes even double doors, airtight rooms, uh, air conditioning systems that have been properly designed so that they, re they don't let any noise in or you can't hear the blower motors, um, clean power. You know, that's, you know, you're getting into, once we start talking in that language, we're talking about 30, 40 grand. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. you know, whisper rooms are a really good Band-Aid and mm -hmm. a lot of clients of mine have these and they sound pretty bad. Uh, out of the box, so we have to do a lot of acoustical treatment um, using additional materials to get them up to snuff. Tell me about about that, not, and not to not to uh, point any fingers at the people who make whisper rooms, but you know they no. make them for general purposes, and you have a very specific person purpose in mind. So oh, this whisper room, this this is kind of like a a closet that sits out in a room somewhere, right? Yeah, it's basically a, a heavy box made out of three quarter inch MDF wood. It's like a it's like a wardrobe, you know. And you walk in, you shut the door, and it knocks down the ambient noise from the outside by about twenty five to forty dB, depending on your frequency range that you're working in. And um, you know, it takes that last bit of noise out of the room. If you got a pretty quiet house, you know, but you got computers, you got a fish tank, you got air conditioning. You jump in the whisper room and it takes out that last, uh, you know, 20 to 40 percent of the background noise you really couldn't deal with otherwise. And at least it's portable. So uh, it's not portable in that you can take it down and, and move it in your car, obviously. But these things weigh about a thousand pounds starting start out. But you can move them to another place. If you're renting, they can be, uh, you know, moved easily and they have a resale value. Put them up on Craigslist and you can sell your your used whisper room. I've helped quite a few people sell off their booths when they've kind of graduated to a custom built space. But yeah, they were designed for all sorts of stuff for practicing, for isolation, for practice rooms, for recording guitars and all sorts of stuff. So when it comes to voiceover, they give you a few sheets of RLX in there, but it takes a lot more thick, dense insulation. I usually will recommend something made out of rock sole or a fiberglass dense material like Owens Corning 703. That kind of material can much better deal with the full vocal range down into the low end because those boxes and any small space a closet anything will just resonate it's got all this bass reflex and it just resonates and rings and we have to get rid of that and uh, we do it with acoustics first and then then I'll tweak an EQ curve for them in their software with a graphic EQ or parametric to to flatten it out even further so so back to the uh, the acoustic treatment you're treating the interior of the room to to stop any further echo or ringing or resonation, right? 
Exactly. It's all about treating the interior. So it's like we'll build a booth, and it's funny. We, 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 we build out the walls. We fill it all with insulation. Then before the drywall goes up, I'll go in and go, it sounds great, doesn't it? It's totally dead. It's beautiful. Then we fill in all that space with drywall, <laughs> and then it yeah. sounds terrible again. Yeah. Then i got to come back in and then put more absorbing material on the, on the, out, you know, on the drywall mm -hmm. on the inside of the room. So we've got the isolation properties of the dense drywall with an air gap between the two walls. Then we have the acoustical absorbing material on the inside to keep the echo from bouncing around and keep it from resonating. And so all those things work together. Wow. So, okay, the next thing, you mentioned that, that after you get the room finished, you still have to go in and, and create an EQ curve. And this is something that you said in, you know, in, in recording software that a, a talent might go and apply to everything he or she records. Um, how, what kind of things do you do to come up with that EQ curve? Is this totally by experience and listening? Or are you doing anything with uh, white noise and, and, and seeing you know, where, the, where the room changes or any, any acoustic analysis? That's a good question. You know, I've played around with the idea of using acoustical analysis. And if, you know, if in the luxury of where I actually get to be in someone's studio physically and, and bring along toys like that, you know, I can do that. But, you know, I think at this point, it's, it really is experience. Um, working with so many different home studios, I've heard almost every scenario. And I just, I really trust my ear. I listen closely. Um, I do actually trust my headphones more than anything because I unfortunately, ironically, don't have a great sounding home studio. I pretty much just have an office here. Um, but I do trust my uh, Biodynamic DT770 Pro headphones a lot. Um, I've been using the same model of headphones for over 10 years. And, uh, you know, that's really important to me, a consistent um, uh, objective um, frame of reference, you know, for the sound. And then, uh, you know, if the room sounds good, it doesn't take a lot. It does not take much EQ tweaking at all. Um, I usually will roll off the bottom end. Um, like I said, that natural sound, we don't want it to be too muddy and boomy. It needs to be very clear and intelligible. So I'll almost always notch out everything below 75, 70 hertz, depending on the voice for women, 80 or 90. If the room is extra boomy and extra muddy sounding, I might even roll off as high as 120 uh, hurts to to deal with that and then if there's one frequency that just seems to ring and the smaller the closet the higher the frequency so if it's a small closet or booth it could be two three hundred hertz i'll notch wow. that out of there and then uh you know maybe a little add a little sizzle at the top end maybe some air you know like a a boost at 20k just to just to get a little extra sizzle and brightening but that high huh okay. yeah yeah Hey, as as far as as uh, well, gosh, man, the, the the mind really lights up here with all kinds of questions. You know, DSing is a pretty interesting tech, uh, technology. I'm sure every um, um, company that makes a DSer or puts one in their mic preamp has a, you know a, a different philosophy on how to detect uh, you know too much energy in in the S range and what to do about it. So it's you know naturally uh, uh, taken out. Is DSing something that's important for every VO talent or or just certain VO talents? I, it's just certain VO talent. I think it's a matter of if they're using the wrong kind of mic for their voice. Um, it's amazing how much we can do by proper mic technique and mic positioning. Um, just getting the mic, you sometimes just twisting it a little off axis, there goes your S, you know. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just a slight change of position and there goes the S. But for more extreme cases, um, you know, I tend to just not, I, I, I'm not a real over geek with the plugins and it's probably because I'm helping hundreds of other people figure this stuff out. So I really stick with the most basic elements. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I work mostly in the Mac environment, so I will use a lot of the Apple Audio Units plugins that every single Mac comes with. Mm -hmm. so, when I, I, so when I do something, they can repl replicate it on their end very easily. Uh -huh. And um, so I, I will often just use a graphic or a parametric find whatever that frequency is that sticks out the most with the S and, and notch it out by 6 dB or so, as opposed to using an actual DS or plug-in. Okay. Um, but it, okay. De it depends on how severe the uh, problem is. And of course, that's also in comp and I'm using the EQ uh, along with the compressor, and I usually will put the EQ uh, before compression. And it seems to, seems to work for most people, except the most extreme cases.
Yeah, actually, that's a pretty interesting uh, conversation there. Is should EQ go before compression in a, in a, a mic uh, processor setup or, or after? And I've seen it done both ways. And I, I guess um, my my own self, I I liked it after for for most applications because if it was well, of course, in radio, a lot of times you know, a jock, uh, a, a talent will want the will want that bottom end boosted up. So we we'll, you know, we'll give a nice bump there at sixty or seventy or seventy five hertz or so, depending on on the on the the bottom end range of, of that talent. Uh, and if that if that bump comes before the compressor, well then the compressor is acting on the bump and and not right. on the, the rest of the audio. So you can get some some you know pumping going on there. But right. in your world of of trying to get very natural audio, it could be what you really want that EQ to do is to correct any aberrations, not create any affectations. Right? Yeah, that's pretty much right. Um, you know, I, I'm I, I the only place I will ever really boost in anything is maybe at the very, very top end. Um, only slightly boost in the bottom range occasionally if uh, they're just, you know, it just needs a little something. But most of what I'm doing is cutting and notching. And so I, I like to do that before compression. And then if I really do want to lay it on and create something that has, you know, a larger than life sound, something that needs to be ready for air, uh, pre produced or pre sweetened, I like to call it, then maybe you can throw up another EQ after the compressor for that for that need. I think that seems to work pretty well that way for me. Ah, so, you, so you're using a separate EQ. So you might have EQ before a compressor and EQ after a compressor. Would you ever use multi-band compression or is this always a, a wide-band compression for a VO talent? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm a wimp when it comes to the multi-band compressor. I know it's incredibly powerful um, and it can, be, it can be used to, you know, amazing results. Isn't that what Orbind? Uses oh well, the, the multi band. The, well, you, you know the very the first multi band for broadcast was uh, developed by Mike Duro, and he oh, made Durow. the the DAP, the the discriminant audio processor, and then uh, you know the the uh, but but since that time, most broadcast audio processors have been multi band. But we're trying to achieve something a little bit different in broadcast yeah. than we are in in in, in VO service. True. So th hence my my question. I, I you know most. Mic processors uh, don't have multiband uh, processing, so I just wondered if if that wasn't I the least bit important. I mean, the company I work for, uh, Axia, uh, Omnia, and, and, and Telos, uh, you know, we have mic processing in the Axia consoles developed by Orban. I mean, <laughs> developed by Omnia, and yeah. uh, and and it's not multiband. It's just it's wideband processing because that seems to be appropriate for for uh, for you know, for for voice purposes. Yeah. But I was wondering if 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 you know any. Talent said, "Hey, I really like the sound of of this or that, uh, you know, multi-band kind of of a processor." See, yeah, I, you know, I, I go ahead, sorry, Chris. Oh, I, I you know, I, it's funny. I had that conversation with uh, production people, uh, and, and even even outside of radio. And usually, the talents, especially if they've been on radio, the talents first. Uh, for, I, I think the first tweak they try to do is a turn up the bass, and then the second tweak they do is is b they try to compress the heck out of their voice, and you know I, it all depends on the application and, and in broadcast purposes, uh, especially when when people are doing voice voiceover work for broadcast. I really think it's important to subscribe to the less is more when it comes to eqing and and that sort of thing, and and you know I really think that you want to have. Uh, as as clean and as as open a product as you can, because the radio station yeah. is going to use their twenty thousand dollars squash box to flatten it all out. So right. if you do that ahead of time, and and you try to take that already really tightly processed voice product and push it through the the processors, they don't do a very good job of making the audio sound better. And you know then it, it sounds really you know it sounds really muffled. Plus, when you're using multi band compression and limiting, if you turn up the bass on your voice. All you're going to get is mud on the other end. The, you know, the bass is going to be so powerful compared to the rest of your voice. So, yeah. um, you know, I, you, you, I would like to see uh, radio guys, radio engineers, follow more of what we've been talking about here with, with uh, you know, being very sensitive to a nice, clean mic technique, nice, clean microphones, uh, you know, kind of less is more with processing. And I, I really think that the, the commercials that jump out at you, uh, jump out at you on radio and TV are the ones that use that technique. Yeah, it's the natural read. The thing that's so hot right now and that's hiring the people for commercial and promo or especially commercial work is sort of like that non-announcer read. They just sort of talk like this. 
You know, that's that's what's hot <laughs> yeah. right now. And, yep. uh, you know, it's it's a different way. To, you, you need to capture it differently. But I, I, I'm a very big less is more kiss type of, uh, uh, I have that philosophy because, you know, it'd be different if I was a producer or it'd be different if I worked in a studio as an engineer and I was getting the product and now I got to like, you know, have total say over what the final mix was going to be. That's where that needs to be happening. But that's not the world that I get to play in. I'm playing at the front end, right at the microphone, right with all the talent. And uh, I just need to make sure that what's going to get to the producer at the other end is something that they're, they're really going to like working with and therefore will we'll want to keep hiring that talent over and over again. And it sounds like having a, a clean, unaffected uh, sound is what a producer would want because then he's got a, this nice, um, predictable slate to, to work with. He's, he's, he's got this thing that he doesn't have to go fix stuff first. Uh, the, the basics are, are there and the producer can then go add whatever he wants to if it's reverb or, or echo or, or sweeten it up or compress the heck out of it, whatever, whatever he needs. Is, is that the philosophy of a, a good VO talent to provide something that's clean and, and, and unaffected? Oh yeah, definitely. That's definitely the philosophy that I use, and 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 that's what most of the clients like to have. It's it's in the, just in a few cases where I have a client who does work for a small market station or commercial work for a low budget, or you know local commercials or webcasts or where they where they expect the talent to provide something that's already it's basically ready for air. Um, you know, sometimes a voice talent will send off their file. Then they'll get they'll watch the final product on YouTube or online or something, and they'll go. It sounds it just sounds flat and terrible, because all they did was take this wave file or MP3 that was sent to them, dropped it into Final Cut, and you know put the music in there, and that was it. And uh, a lot of times now the with the budgets getting getting shrinking and you know the, the expectations increasing um, for a product, you know it's like they the the engineers are being taken out of the equation. I can't believe how many post houses and trailer houses have um, a final cut editing bay or avid editing bay with a Zephyr and the talent is going right into that final cut track. And the editor in there very, very rarely has any audio processing uh, experience. So unless the talent is sending them something that already sounds punched up, um, it, it's not going to be a good mix. So it's, it's, it's all over the board. It's all over the board. It's, it's interesting. You, you, you yeah. bring up something that actually uh, one of my production directors and I were going over a couple of weeks ago, and it happened to be a major network, uh, TV network, and their, their promo spots that they sent to us put on the air. And you could tell it was the same voice, but over the course of a, a few months, how, you know, it started out with really decent processing, and then it could, you know, there were some that were just awful, and there was absolutely no consistency. You'd have some stuff that was absolutely not processed at all, and some of it that was, that was very sweet. And uh, it kind of leads me back again, you know, with the production houses. Um, you know, you can you can always add things, but you can't ever take them away when it comes to <laughs> things like EQ and processing and stuff. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, 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 you're right. I mean, you know, with your step, it needs to be as natural as possible because then the you know the production people can then take it. Uh, you know, at the at the the spot houses or whatever can take it and add or, or subtract what they want. But even they kind of have to have some responsibility in making sure that what they send out is is clean after that. You know, you want to punch it up and make it sizzle a little bit. That's fine. But again, you know, a lot of us spend a lot of money on on audio processing, expecting uh, stuff that isn't you know that has a dynamic range to work with to begin sure. with. So you know, that's what I stuff I, that's. You know, yeah, I tell clients all the time, like, don't listen to the radio, then go home and then expect to create that sound. If you're right. basing the, the results of what you're recording in your home booth on what you heard in the car on the way home, you're completely screwing up your frame of reference because, like you said, you're, I tell them, I was like, that's, that's some really heavy-duty you know, uh, processing that happens before it hits the radio or the air. And uh, don't don't go by that. If you want to go by something, go by example. Then um, you know at least TV is a little less com little less processed. But uh, go onto a website like VoiceBank.net where there's thousands and thousands of hours of people's auditions and demo materials to to listen to. 
Hey, we're going to take a, a quick break to hear from our sponsor right now. And when we come back, we're going to continue talking with George Whittem about building uh, voiceover studios. And I'm learning a lot here. Sounds like George's philosophy, you know, get the basics right. And uh, that you got to get that right or else uh, else it's not going to be right. Uh, and George, I hope you can give us a, a, a some uh, some war stories uh, too about some of your your clients. If if you don't name, name if you don't name names, that's okay. But uh, uh, I'd like to hear some interesting things about uh, what you've seen and experienced in the field. Absolutely. Hey, our sp our sponsor is um, is my employer. Thank you so much, Axia Audio, for for sponsoring this little show and helping get the word out uh, to engineers all over the world uh, about what what is going on in, in broadcast engineering. Axia Audio. These are the guys who uh, helped to invent the, the live wire uh, real-time audio protocol uh, for getting uh, audio over IP immediately. Now, this is, by the way, live wire, this technology, this is not for getting audio long distances like over the phone company, over the Internet. Uh, live wire is what you need to run uh, a studio or a cluster of studios with uh, absolutely live, unbuffered um, and also uncompressed, that is not uh, not bit compressed, but linear audio over a standard Ethernet IP network. This makes it very easy to connect audio consoles with uh, all kinds of different pieces of equipment uh, in the studio and in, in the rack room. And, uh, hey, Chris Tobin, are you with us right here? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. All right. Chris, you, uh, you know, your former employer was uh, CBS, and you were involved in, uh, in, in building out uh, or in putting some new studios at WINS. Um, take just a minute here and tell us about how Livewire helped you to get that done uh, in New York City in, in an efficient manner. Well, uh, we had uh, four studios that needed to be uh, redone. Uh, the project entailed um, not going offline, so we had a build in place, which you can imagine is not easy at a 24-hour news radio station here in New York City. Uh, so Livewire, Axia, we looked at it and realize that it is, I'll use the phrase, plug and play. Uh, you do a little programming and, and, and you know beforehand before you start uh, plugging stuff in. And we uh, planned it out. We did one studio, one control room at a time, uh, built it out, you know, stripped it out completely, brand new countertops, uh, furniture, and then uh, dropped in the consoles. Uh, all Cat5 wiring, very traditional stuff, nothing special. Uh, point to point, did everything uh, within a couple of months. Each studio took no more than, I think, a week and a half to get done. Remember, this is a live, in-place uh, job. This is not something where I can walk in, brand new facility, uh, you know, the, the rooms are empty, nobody to bother you. If you had that case, uh, we did build one of the studios in less than, I think, a day <laughs> as a quick ad hoc because we had an emergency come up. But over a course of a couple of months, we built out four studios online, never went off the air once, never had a hiccup. And during that time, we had one, two six live broadcasts, two, four breaking news stories, one of them an airplane flying into a building, a Yankees uh, player that died, and then a plane and a couple other incidences. So it was very busy newsroom while we were building. And the best part about it, I will say, uh, the IP technology and the fact that you can program and get the audio you need anywhere on that LAN network, as, as Kirk pointed out, it's uh, real time, uncompressed, and wherever you can drop the CAT6 cable, you have your audio sources and destinations. And uh, our newsroom required a lot of, if you will, crazy mix minus returns, uh, full wire audio paths to and from locations off site, and uh, the live wire capabilities using the various nodes just made it real easy. I mean, I literally dropped in cables in places last minute. A producer position was made ad hoc in the middle of the newsroom. One Cat5 cable, pair of headphones, microphone, and a node, and off we were. I mean, literally in seconds in, in many cases. So, uh, Understand, think out of the box. I will say that because I've had many friends come by and see the facility we put together mm -hmm. and were somewhat amazed at how complex the workflow was and that the simplicity in which we did it with the live wire. <laughs> I've gone into, into so many uh, uh, Axia studios, including uh, the one that, that you put together at, at Winds in, in New York, and most folks are, are amazed at um, where's all the wire? Well... This is a network. I mean, imagine if in your office, 
in your office uh, uh, situation, you, if, you, if you wanted your computer to talk to the internet, that was one wire. And another wire to go to this printer, and another wire to go to that printer, and another wire to go to the, to the rest of the office LAN, uh, or, to, or to this computer or that computer. And this is the whole beauty of being on a network. When you can get all the audio onto an Ethernet IP network, then you just need a cat cable and you've got access to everything. Every resource and every destination that is on the network, you've got access to. And this makes it so easy for an engineer to design, plan, wire, execute, and configure, and then operate uh, studios. Whether you're talking about a small situation, like my little radio station in, in Cleveland, Mississippi, where we have one live wire studio, soon to be two, uh, or whether you're talking about a huge outfit, well, like Winds, which is pretty big, but then you have places like um, uh, over in, uh, in Prague, Czech Republic, where you've got uh, something like uh, 50 studios of, uh, of Axia live wire all connected together, and you have something like 4,000 sources and 4,000 destinations all on the network, makes it very easy to, uh, to add things, subtract things, and, and be flexible wherever you need a, a certain audio anywhere in, in the building, you got it. And, of course, uh, the sizes of places anywhere in between. Hey, there's the, um, the Element console at the Twit Network, and it's, it's right now producing uh, custom mix minuses for each of the participants in this, uh, in, in this show. Um, I'm hearing everybody but me. George Whittem is hearing everybody but George. Uh, Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr are each hearing everybody but themselves. Uh, mix minus is automatic. So many cool advantages. Listen, I don't want to take up the rest of the show with, with Axia, so tell you what, why don't you go to the Axia website at axiaaudio.com. Plenty of white papers there, examples of, of, uh, of how this technology works. Uh, there's a great document called Intro to Livewire Version 2, uh, 2.0, 2.1 something. Uh, this document was written in part by, uh, by Steve Church, uh, the founder of, of Telos. And you're going to find it to be uh, very interesting if, if you haven't read it already. About 80 pages long or so and just tells all about the, uh, the live wire story uh, and, and how, how things work and how, they, uh, how it fits together. And you know, if you need a little background in networking, it's got that in there. If you know all about networking, skip that and get right to the salient points of how live wire works and what it can do for you. Uh, also, be, please feel welcome to, to uh, sign up for our catalog if you haven't gotten that yet. It's the NOW catalog from Telos, Omni, and Axia. Happy to send you one. And if you buy any thing from Telos Omni or actually you're probably going to find uh, you're going to find uh, that a catalog comes in, in the box too. All right. Thanks a lot to our uh, uh, sponsor, uh, Axia Audio, for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Radio Tech. All right. Back to George Whittem. George, you still with us? I am it's still here. here. All right. Just got to pick right, up right. the mic game. So, so uh, man, just a, a thousand questions and, and 15, 20 minutes left in our, in our time together here. Um, what, so many engineers want to know about mic selection. You know, there are so many brands and models out there. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I used to use this fabulous microphone. I have it right over here uh, from Violet. This is a condenser mic, and I just love this thing. Um, uh, but uh, I also have gotten this uh, Heil microphone from, from Bob Heil. It's a dynamic microphone, and uh, a lot of them are used at the Twit Network. I love the way it sounds, too. They sound different. I like them both. This one is probably more affected. I'm not sure it's as natural, but I like the way it sounds, whereas the, the Violet condenser mic, very natural, but maybe you had to know how to work it just right to get it to sound good. Tell me how you and a VO talent would go about selecting a mic or maybe a couple of mics to, to sound best for that talent. Yeah, well, it, you know, the, 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 the dynamic mics really do have an advantage in that they are, um, because of their design and because of their low sensitivity, and they sound pretty nice when you work them up close. They are, they are really forgiving. You can you can deal with a room with not so great acoustics, and a little bit more background noise. And whereas condenser mics are a little a lot more persnickety. They hear a lot more. And uh, somebody I've heard say say a few times, a Neumann U87 can hear a mouse fart across the room. Oh uh, no, kid, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's the that's that's the blessing and the curse of these mics. Um but, you know, it of course, if you're going to if the budget's part of the concern, I, there's so many options under 300 bucks now. It's mind-boggling. That sound surprisingly good. Uh the AT2035 uh, is a great budget mic. The VX uh, I'm sorry, the MXL uh, V89, I think it is, is real smooth and it's got low, pretty low noise. Um, the 
Oh man, I mean, I could just drop mics all night. If 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 for for some people that want the absolute most brain dead simple home studio setup, and I set up these mostly for like screen actors that uh, have no interest whatsoever in knowing what's going on with the uh, with their equipment. Some of the USB mics now, even they're actually getting to the point where I can actually recommend them. The PG42 USB by Shure. That's a surprisingly decent sounding USB mic. It's really, really quite nice. It's got a pretty low noise floor for a USB mic. And then uh, the MXL uh, 009 2496 USB mic. That's sort of like, I'd say, a top of the line USB mic. And that's still like 400 bucks. Um, but yeah, when people are just getting started, I don't get a, I don't waste a lot of time and energy in, in budgeting for a microphone. Um, and I don't recommend beginners going out and trying a lot of mics because they'll get completely overwhelmed. They're not going to hear what it is from one mic to the next that makes the difference. Mm. But when it comes to more uh, seasoned talent that have been at it for a while, it's so funny here in LA, the, the 800 pound gorilla microphone is the Sennheiser 416, the shotgun mm. microphone. The first time I saw one in a voiceover booth, I just was scratching my head. Because I, I, I did production sound mixing too. I was used to having one of these on the end of a boom pole. Yep. And um, I was like, what on earth? Why is this? What is this doing here? Well, it just ended up in the hands of a prominent voice talent that uh, thought it was the only way he was going to, it was the only way they were going to get clean audio of him sitting in the, sitting in a studio next to a console. So um, it's, it's the voice actor who did the love boat. The, all the VO for the Love Boat. I, he's the most, one of the most notorious. Ernie Anderson. Talent. Ernie, Ernie Anderson. Anderson. Thank you. Yeah. His name slips yeah. out of my. Ernie. They Ooh, put yeah. one up in front of Ernie uh, because Ernie didn't want to be in the booth where people could talk uh, about him behind his back. So he wanted to sit in the control room right next to the board. <laughs> and the only mic they could find that could that could tolerate that kind of a ambient noise and back and and reject it was a shotgun. I think a four fifteen. It just stuck. Uh, you know, when one prominent voice talent uses it, more people start using it, and all of a sudden it becomes one of the go-to mics. Sure. But I don't think it works for everybody. It's certainly not that great for most female voices because it's got a lot of uh, presence peak and a lot of presence boost, so it tends to get sibilant really quick. Um, of course, being a, cardi a super cardioid, it's got a very small uh, window that you have to be in. You have to almost have your head in a vice. Uh, Google uh, George Del Hoyo, D E L H O Y O, and try to find some, or maybe go to YouTube and Google his name. Find a video clip of George. He's on a 416 and he's talking, and his hands are going mile a minute. He's so physical, but his head is perfectly locked in front of that 416. <laughs> That's quite it's a, a technique. Totally diff yeah, it's such a it's a totally <laughs> different world, you know. Um, but you know, Neumanns are pro you know Neumanns are everywhere. TLM one hundred three is one of the love hate mics. Some people just think it's fantastic. Some people can't stand it. Um, I have a few clients with U eighty sevens, but not too many because, like I said, to get a three thousand dollar mic like that to sound good and not pick up stuff you don't want takes a really Great sounding, very quiet room. So not too many people are using that. Um, there's some. There's some. You know, I like. I like. I like talking about some of the smaller companies that don't have the notoriety of Neumann, like Mojave Audio, which is right here in the LA area. They make a beautiful one called the MA201 FET, and it's under a thousand. I think it's in the eight hundred dollar range. And it there's some amazingly super high fidelity, fantastic sounding, very quiet. Amazing, uh, give a Neumann run for the money mics now in the sub $800 range. Another one called uh, Charter Oak, another company called Charter Oak, mm -hmm. uh, who's in New England. Um, incredible microphone. I mean, if you go to NAM or AES or even NAB, but not so much NAB, more NA NAM or NA a AES, it blows your mind how many new mics come up, come out every year. It's just making it all that harder now to, to pick a microphone. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's I, I just I like to make sure the room is dialed in. If the room's dialed in acoustically, if uh, the talent has good technique, I can uh, okay, for an example, Don LaFontaine, I worked for him. I was his home studio tech for a while. 
his go-to mic at the time, at the time of his passing, was still the Manly uh, cardioid, a re- reference cardioid. It's about a twenty-eight hundred dollar tube mic. He occasionally would get another mic in there that somebody would send him, you know, hoping that Don would endorse their product or give it the right. seal of approval. He had a Browner in there. He had SE twenty-two hundred mics from a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars, and he would switch them out from time to time. Just based on whatever Mike was sent was sent to him, did what did it, did any engineer ever once complain that Don changed mics or say what what mic is that Don uh, you're not sounding quite as great no way <laughs> as Don <laughs> told me one time he said I could talk into a tin can as long as they could hear me they're happy but now now, now but, what about Don himself would, would Don notice a difference from one mic to the next or uh, would he definitely hear one and not like it. Yeah, well, Don had some engineering background. Uh, he actually did audio engineering, uh, geez, in the 60s, I think. So he definitely had an ear for that stuff, and he, li- he liked equipment. He really liked gear. Um, he, was, he was into it, um, and he definitely could hear differences, but he, he always went back to that manly mic. Um, it's got a really aggressive uh, sound, and Don's voice was an interesting mixture of low rumble and just, but also it had a, a presence in the mid range that could just cut through any mix. Yeah. And I think that's why he was so, other than just being a consummate professional and a one take wonder and all that, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people liked working with him, but his voice quality was just amazing, one of a kind. So he, he, could, he could make almost any mic uh, uh, sound good. I, I think we got to at least spend a few minutes on the subject of mic preamps uh, sure. uh, for for a couple of clients that, that I've had. I've I've gone through a number of preamps and you know been been a little happy, a little disappointed. And and uh, um, what what do you look for in what a mic preamp can do? And I'll I guess for me the first thing is it's got to be very low noise because that yeah. noise will just get sucked up in in, in processing and, and sound bed. What do you look for? That's definitely the the very first criteria is low noise. I, I really recommend most of my clients do all their processing, if any at all, and I, we talked about that earlier, doing it in the box in their software. Um, so the, the requirements to have a lot of bells and whistles, channel strips, that kind of stuff is less and less. However, um, there's a few preamps that just seem to persist. One of them is the Avalon 737 uh, preamp. It's the tube uh, preamp. It's very, very clean for a tube preamp, um, but I still find, I still kind of lean away from tubes when I'm choosing the preamp because that means something else for somebody to have to, that means more maintenance. That means replacing tubes. Um, It means a lot more heat. Uh, You know, things that I I just don't like, especially if the preamp's going to end up inside someone's booth. So I tend to lean towards solid state and at the low end of the spectrum, well, the lowest end of the spectrum, if you want a channel strip, the DBX-286A, which some of you guys in radio probably have used because it's, mm-hmm. it's a little bit like a 520AD um, with not quite as many knobs, but it's a full feature unit with a really surprisingly good downward expander gate. Um, that one I've set up for quite a few people when they have to go straight to ISDN and they need a little bit of gating in the signal to clean up the bottom end, to clean up the noise floor. Um, and then uh, going up from there, like the Grace uh, the Grace M101, I think for $500, that one's pretty much impossible to beat for just ultra clean, you know, wire with gain preamp. Um, and then it came out with the M103, which is uh, that preamp in a channel strip form with a compressor and a uh, compressor and EQ. I don't think there's a gate on that. And I've been swapping out Avalon 737s for those where I want to just try to clean up the signal, just get a little bit lower noise floor. And I find that those things sound uh, uh, phenomenal. And if you if you got the if you got the wallet, um, man, the Focusrite Red Seven um, or the Red One. I think the Red One. No, the Red Seven. I think is the channel strip. Is uh, <clears throat> gosh, in- incredible sounding. But, you know, four plus grand. So. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, I, no, I think we, we could go on and on. I'll tell you what, yeah. you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, Don LaFontaine. Maybe there's, a, there's another story or two that, that you, could, uh, you could tell us about. You know, what, what did you learn 
um, you know, working with a talent, what was maybe a really teachable moment in terms of, oh, man, I picked the wrong mic for that guy, or I should have done a, you know, I, I, we came back later and had to do more insulation, or, man, this particular talent was really hard to find the right e e EQ for. What, what uh, you know, what, what happy accidents or learning moments can you tell us about? Oh, yeah, well, with Don, that was an interesting situation because, I mean, uh, well, first of all, the first time I met him, I didn't have the first clue who he was. Not a clue. I, I, the name didn't ring a bell, anything. And the guy that referred me to him, Steve Nafshin, who's a client and a friend of mine here in L.A., he said, George, you, you'll know. You'll know who he is. Trust me. I said, okay. And I went to his amazing home in, uh, uh, near, near uh, oh, somewhere in Las Feliz, and, uh, and went in, still didn't really know who he was, went down to his studio down in the basement that was already there because he had a studio with ISTN long before I got to know him in 2006 is when I met him. And uh, still didn't know who he was. He went into the booth. He said, I got to go run to the booth and do this, whole, do this thing for Fox. He goes in there and does a spot for The Simpsons or something. And I just slapped my head and just gasped. I said, oh, my gosh. I'm working with the icon of voiceover. You know, people call him the voice of God. It blew my mind. But, you know, that said, he had 10-year-old gear. Everything in there was like 10 years old. When I got there, he was running his Manly straight into a Mackie 24 by 8 console because the preamp, well, there was no preamp. It was, I mean, he was running the preamp on the Mackie, but it blew yeah. my mind. And there was like a buzz on the signal. And that was really the impetus for me coming in in any way is because Steve was telling me, the guy that referred me, was saying, Don's got a buzz on his signal and we got to get rid of this. And people have been kind of tolerating it because it's Don. But <laughs> we got to fix this, you know. So when I went in there, there was a lot of problems. And uh, the biggest problem we had of all at Don's place was his studio, for whoever designed it, thought it was a good idea to put every piece of technology for his entire home all in that room. And they had, he had Crestron, you know, with multi-room entertainment. He had the lighting system in the entire house was all computer-controlled electronic dimming. All the dimmers were in a panel directly behind the mixing console position. Oh. I mean, the RFI or maybe even magnetic uh, interference, maybe is more what it was, was atrocious. It was so bad. I mean, uh, it was, I had it because he had a good preamp. We had, we, we put a good preamp in there, uh, in the booth and we put it at the mic in the booth. So we were pushing the high, you know, the best signal possible back over. And then we yanked out that Mackie, put an out little Allen and Heath mix wizard in there. And, uh, but man, even with all that, and I got like a top of the line, you know, noise, uh, a noise filtering unit, uh, it didn't matter. No matter what we did, everything else in that studio had some kind of a buzz on it when, in the evening when all the lights started coming on. It yeah. was just atrocious. So, yeah, it was just frustrating, and it was, it, it was so far along that I would have had to t tear everything out. It would have been a major, major remodel. If I knew then what I know now about Faraday cages... I probably would have made a you know a copper mesh screen over the whole thing and then grounded it and done did all that, but you know I learned some of that stuff as I went along. But yeah, it sometimes uh, sometimes the the top tier talent you know get bad advice and get bad engineering and bad mm -hmm. bad engineers working for them. They see I guess these guys they see dollar signs, and uh, you know they go in there send them all, sell them a lot of impressive stuff, but then. Where the rubber meets the road, they make some really bad mistakes, and that's that's kind of tend to be what happened there. Um, otherwise, you know, a lot of the most of the horror stories I ever deal with are just with technical problems that interrupt a client and keep them from earning a living. Uh, in voiceover, if you if you have an outage in IS, on an ISDN and you can't get to a studio quick enough or you can't work around it. You know, there's no real uh, there's no real contracts anymore in VO. So a guy who's doing all of the NBC drama evening, you know, uh, promo spots, next day it could be somebody else, uh, and they've lost a twenty, thirty, fifty, eighty thousand dollar gig uh, because something went down. So the studios just have to be super simple, super reliable. Um, wherever possible, backups in place. I like getting something like Source Connect to back up ISDN these days. And, um, you know, that's, that seems to be the trend. It's just 
keeping things as reliable as possible. So, my, so I have as few of these uh, hair-pulling phone calls that make my, you know, make my heart jump into my throat when I get them. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Chris Tobin had a, had a question. Chris? Yeah, and along the lines of uh, keeping things simple and reliable so you don't lose uh, revenue for yourself, what would you say for someone starting out in, in voice work, uh, whether it's commercial, non-commercial, corporate video, corporate audio, that kind of stuff, if they're looking to do a home studio, roughly, you know, what would somebody should they, what they should they expect to budget, cost wise? You know, That's just good. basic stuff to be able to do do what they have to do. Well, you know, if you get creative with some moving blankets and some pillows and curtains and kind of make a dead corner in your bedroom or your your office, which you can do, you can go quite a long ways with a very small budget that way. You know, set yourself aside about a thousand bucks. Get yourself like a you know a USB mic. Um, if you're on a Mac, get Twisted Wave. I love, love, love Twisted Wave for recording and editing. It's just super simple and easy to learn, and it's fast and reliable. If you're on Windows, um, sorry, but if you're on Windows, uh, <laughs> get a get a um, uh, Audacity. It's not bad considering it's free. It's pretty yeah. capable. I like SoundForge. Uh, in the Windows environment, I think that's the, the they've got the best combination of features and simplicity. And uh, you know, get yourself a real sturdy microphone, a pop filter. Uh, I'm sorry, microphone stand. Uh, uh, microphone wise, you know, I, I love that PG42. It's not it's a hard one to flaw. And then budget the rest of that money on on expertise. Uh, you know, if you've got a thousand to spend, don't buy a thousand dollar mic. Just buy you know, six or seven hundred dollars worth of gear and software, and put the rest of your budget into hiring somebody to make it sound amazing. Because you can spend hours, days, weeks, months, sometimes years, uh, getting wrong advice or varied advice from the forums and all this stuff. And boy, I've had clients where they're like, "Oh my gosh, I wish, I wish I knew about you like two years ago." And, you know, I'll say, how long have you had your setup like this? And they're like, oh, about a year and a half. I'm like, are you getting a lot of work? And they're like, no, that's why I'm hiring you. And uh, <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're not getting advice from people and they're not getting objective feedback on their audio. And so they're not, find, they're not realizing the reason why they're not getting calls. It's not their talent. It's their sound quality. So hire, hire an expert. Make sure you have somebody there physically or at least virtually to make sure the room is room is tuned, your mic positions there, and, and you and you've learned how to use your software because that is I can't possibly uh, emphasize enough how important that is. Okay, well, that I'll makes sense. You, so a thousand dollars, that's good. Yeah. I'll tell yeah. you what sucks really now was that is that uh, we're uh, we're basically out of time, but I want to take enough time to ask uh, ask George to George uh, understand that you. Uh, you have a, a podcast of your own where you give uh, uh, this kind of advice and, and talk about about studios and VOs. Where can people find you? Oh well, the the, the webcast is called East West Audio Body Shop, and we were clearly influenced by Car Talk and also by Leo himself and, and his shows. Um, but that's at ewabs.com, e w a b s dot com. Check that out. That's every Sunday live, just like us. Uh, we are now live on at six o'clock. Uh, Pacific, and uh, my my voiceover uh, studio consulting website is vo studio tech t e c h dot com, and there's a lot of info on there, facts, articles I've written, tutorial videos, uh, you name it, anything you can imagine that would help you set up a home studio. Um, so there's a there's a my blog is on there under the resource there's a blog post I try to get a blog post up every week to two weeks and sometimes when I get a you know I'm on a bender I might get two or three in in one night um, but uh, sign up the mailing list and uh, I'll keep you in the loop whenever something like pops up that I think is going to be a game changer or just a handy tip for voiceover um, I'll uh, I'll put it in the newsletter or I'll put it up on the blog. Very cool. Very cool. Hey, uh, Chris Tarr, I'm sorry. We, do, do we block you out or are you still there? I, oh, you know, I, <laughs> no, I was still there. Just fascinating stuff that George was talking about. I was just, uh, just, just quietly, intently listening. Yeah, I was, trying, 
<laughs> trying to try to soak it all in. Uh, I'll, I hope we have uh, George back again sometime. But since it, it may be some time before we do, uh, I do feel welcome to check out George's uh, website uh, and uh, at uh, was was it vostudiotech.com? V O as in voiceover. vostudiotech.com. Did I get that right? That's right. You got it. Thank all you right, guys. Good. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you for, for being on, on the show. And, hey, we have to do a little giveaway here. You know, for the last uh, quite a few weeks, we've been giving away one license of Omnia AXE. This is software that runs as a service in Windows. So, hey, at least it's reliable. It runs in that, in that service area. And it does audio processing and then audio encoding to make, uh, make streams for you uh, that you can then send out to a Shoutcast server or to a Wowza server and get your audio on the web if that's what you need to do. Or if you just need some audio processing, you can just go in and out uh, of, uh, of your computer and get uh, get processed audio out using Omnia AX, uh, AX processing. Uh, this processing is uh, you know appropriate for obviously web streaming. So it will um, it will give you the you know the, the kind of audio that the encoder is, is looking for. Let's give one away to um, to someone who retweeted the announcement that this show was starting about an hour ago. And I need uh, let's see uh, George. I need a random number here between one and uh, twenty two. Oh, let's pick seven. 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 Hang on. One, two, three, is four, that, five. Is that six. between one? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that is. All right. Congratu congratulations to, um, let me see here. Um, I think I know this person. Of course, I, I know half of our listeners. Um, let's see. Fast Break 8000. That's the Twitter handle. Fast Break 8000. I thought I saw. Is that, I think that is Vinny Lopez. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Oh, Vinny awesome. Lopez. Hey, congratulations, Vinny. Thanks for watching and, and retweeting. retweeting. Uh, is, is Vinny a current or past SBE uh, president? He is. Maybe past. Past. Past? Yeah. Just past? Okay. Vinny Lopez, uh, Fast Break 8000 on Twitter. Thanks for. Uh, Thanks for retweeting. Thanks to everybody who retweeted. I sure appreciate it. Um, and uh, can't give away one to everybody, but Vinny Lopez, you are the Omnia AXE winner. Hey, thanks also to, uh, um, to AxiaAudio.com for sponsoring uh, this episode of This Week in, in Radio Tech. I certainly appreciate them. And I'll tell you who else appreciates them. Every one of the folks who owns one of the 2,500-plus Axia consoles in service around the world using uh, Ethernet IP audio. Really fantastic stuff. Works so well. I'm a user, and uh, someday we'll get. Someday we'll we'll bring Chris Tar into the fold too. Chris, you gonna be a user one day? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, when you do, Chris, just don't do it in the winter. But I'll come up there and help you out a little bit. Cool. I'll tell you, what, you know, whatever. If we if we do it, it's gonna be in nice weather. I'll make sure to plan for that. And make sure there's plenty of beer cheese soup. Absolutely. All right. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, thanks, everybody, for being with us. Uh, George Winham, appreciate you being our guest. Uh, folks can look at you at uh, vostudiotech.com. Thanks again. Thank you, man. I had a and, blast. It was an honor to be on the show. And from Manhattan, uh, the man who can't go anywhere right now because it's all locked down, <laughs> Chris Tobin. Thanks for being with us, Chris. <laughs> You're welcome. And thank you, George. I learned a lot and it reinforced some of the thoughts and ways I've done stuff as well. Thank you again. Oh, my pleasure. And, and live from Muckwanago, Wisconsin, Chris Tarr. Thanks for being with us, buddy. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll look. We'll look for you on, on, on next show. Um, next show, Terry Bond will be our guest, and the next one after that, it's Bob Orb. And thank you for being with us. We appreciate you watching and telling your friends to watch. Also, uh, this week in Radio Tech, we'll see you next week. Bye, bye, everybody.